you probably don't know this. I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> what, no applause? I said, I'm kind of a big deal. Now, it's not that I, that I think that. The pastor of Tri-State Fellowship, the lead pastor of Tri-State Fellowship, declared me the doctor of love. So I'm just saying, I'm a big deal. I walk in the company of men like Einstein. Theory of relativity. It's relative whether or not I'm the doctor of love or not. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, this morning is a little bit intimidating to talk about this subject, even though it's, it's a pretty simple one. Somebody came up to me this week and said, Hey, Tim, you probably don't have to prepare for this. We're, I mean, we're talking about love, right? It's kind of like asking Einstein to talk about the theory of relativity in 31 minutes. You know, how do you, how do you, you know, condense that down? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump right straight to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the most celebrated scripture, I believe, except for maybe John 3, 16 and all the Bible. Even people that do not follow Christ are all into this passage. Why? Because you put it in a card as a husband, and your wife goes, oh, that is so sweet. Love's patient, love's kind. Oh, that's so amazing. You know, because it just stirs up all these wonderful internal feelings. And, uh, of course, the guy's going, Phew. man, I'm glad I got, you know, I found that somewhere on a card somehow. But we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13, and let's just jump right in together as we talk about this thing called issues. I did have one other thing I, I would share with you really quickly is that I had a lady uh, outside this body Say, listen, I've, I've heard some really good things about Tri-State. And I'm going, <laughs> good, that's good, that's what I like to hear. And I said, well, what have you heard? And she said, I, I just heard you guys love really well. And, and I mean, people just do things well at Tri-State. Well, I actually happen to believe that's the truth. Except I looked at her, I couldn't resist because we're in this series. I said, oh, honey, you don't even know the half of it. We got issues. <laughs> we got a lot of issues. And that's the reality. We may love well, and I do believe you love well, but we've still got issues just like the Corinthians had. 1 Corinthians 13, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, not just some faith, but all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, my one disclaimer for the whole sermon is going to be this. Um, Randy next week is going to unpack everything there is to know about spiritual gifts in 31 minutes. But today, it's not my primary discussion to talk about spiritual gifts. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not even saying they don't exist. I'm not here to debate with you about one way or the other this morning because that's not the point of this particular passage. It is not the emphasis of this passage. As a matter of fact, there are some believe that chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is actually an autobiography of the Apostle Paul looking back at his ministry so far in his life, and he's trying to make a point, first of all, about how he's conducted his ministry, but then, but then in a much bigger way, since he's had so much trouble with these people in Corinth that have issues, to make the point to them that, look, guys, I don't even really care what gifts you've got. So he doesn't say these gifts that he mentions here don't exist. He said, there's something bigger and better than all those gifts that you have. So everybody's got that, right? I need everybody to go like this. You understand? I'm not debating the issue of spiritual gifts this morning. Everybody? Yes? Okay. We're talking about a whole other thing. It, the, the, the issue of spiritual gifts is, frankly, incidental to this particular point that the Apostle Paul wants to make. And so if I had to categorize these first few verses that he talked about, it, it would be like this. And by the way, this is bad grammar. Doing, don't do it. Doing, don't do it. And he first mentions tongues. And if you don't know, tongues is a spiritual gift uh, where a person speaks in a language in which they do not know. 
There's a whole set of discussions that goes with that. But again, he's not assuming it's not true. First of all, he says he's done it, and he recognizes that there were people in the body that were doing it. But he says, here's the problem that's been happening for you in the Corinthian church. Um, you guys have become the gong show. Now, and if you're young, you don't even know what that is. It's just look it up on Google. You become the gong show, and it's a, it's a show where people used to perform, and they were so bad, if they were really bad, they'd take a big hammer and hit the gong, like a big, you know, a gong. And, and everybody get annoyed, and the people get mad, and things would fly. It was great. Uh, but he says, you have used a legitimate gift, and you've turned it into this competition thing, that you're better than me because either you do it more, you did do it better, or you don't even do it at all, and therefore you've become like a gong show. And it's kind of like when a person does something really well, and you're sitting there watching them, and you're going, I want to lay hands on you, and it's not to bless you. You know, they're just completely annoying. And so whatever benefit, Paul would say, is... Whatever the benefit is, it's lost because you don't have love. This is all about you and your show. So, first of all, gong show. Then he talks about the whole idea of prophecy. There's two ideas of prophecy in the Scripture, if you don't know. One is foretelling. So one might say there's a degree in which what I'm doing right now is prophesying. I, I, in the sense of I, I'm foretelling. I'm telling the truth to you and making an application to your life. But there's another one that has the whole idea of future telling. I don't have time to unpack that today, but clearly from this passage, there were people who had a spiritual gift of prophecy. Now, here's the problem, both with the Corinthians, and frankly, in this day. I've been around a lot of people in my day that claim to be prophets, either one of those definitions. And not all of them, but I've been around a lot of them, and they really think they're it. You know, the prophet comes in on Sunday morning or some meeting they're having, and everybody's going, oh, there's the prophet. Ruth McQuee for the prophet. And the reason they're doing that is because the prophet's going, get out of my way. <laughs> you know, he really thinks that, or she thinks that they are so impressive because they have this gift of prophecy. And it was the same thing happening back then. People were holding up how amazing they were. And I call that the I am the man show. You need to be impressed with me, and you need to treat me with some special reverence because I'm a prophet. Well, newsflash. Paul said, there's no love coming out of you, so the words falling out of your mouth are going, boom. There's nothing to them, and they have no impact on the people that, you're, that are hearing you. As a matter of fact, you're actually hurting people. Then there's the I got more show. <clears throat> Those are people who have great faith. Now, when I was in uh, South America, uh, Peru more specifically, I, I visited a group of people to do some teaching. And the story is they'd just gone to a rather large crusade, and all of these people, no making this up, they were very, very, very poor people. They literally saved for months to buy the ticket to go downtown or go into the main city to participate in this great conference. And while they were there, they were promised this, that if by faith you believe it, God will deliver you from your poverty. And so they went, the conference was had, things happened at the conference that supposedly would have freed them, and not one person that went was freed from poverty. Now, when I got there, they were getting ready to have their last church meeting. And you need to understand, that church, when I say church, I use it loosely because it was four houses that they knocked out the inside walls, propped everything up, and kind of pieced it together with the aluminum and siding. And as I stood there in front of them, just 15 minutes before I started to teach, they said, just thought you ought to know this is the last meeting we're going to have because everybody here is ready to give up. Because they put everything they had, literally most of them spent food money to save up to go get freed from poverty. And they're just done. They're done with Jesus, they're done with the church, and they're done with religion. Well, thank you very much. I really wanted to get up and speak to those people. Now, this is my point. How many of you have planned for months before to go participate in something that by faith you're believing God's going to do something? Well, I can't tell you, I can't name a whole bunch of times that that's happened in my life. 
I met these people. I talked to these people. And they were some, even in the middle of their discouragement, they were some of the greatest people of faith I've ever met in my life. And there was one fellow overheard me talking that was a part of the body, but he was the one that had arranged going down for the meeting. And he comes up to me and he says this. You know the real problem with these people, the reason they didn't get delivered from poverty? No, no, what was it? He says, they don't have the kind of faith I have. Well, can, can you see how you, that would give people the attitude is I got it and you don't? And what does that do to a person's faith? Can you hear and feel the arrogance in that? Then it goes on. There's another show that's in town. And so all these people are doing what would be described as the right things. And frankly, even some would describe it as, as an expression of the love of God in people's lives. But there's no love happening. That was what was happening to the Corinthians and what happens today. So doing doesn't do it. And um, next thing he mentions is charity. And this is the I Do Life Right show. Now, I want to be careful here because, you know, it's not cool in America anymore if you don't do volunteer work. So how many of you are headed off to college here in the next two years? Okay, great. Here's what's going to happen. When they get together with the counselor that talks to you about what university you might want to go to if you choose to go to college, um, they're going to look at your resume, and you better hope you have some community service on there. Because if not, they're going, Psst, man, you're never going to get into that school. You need to beef up this community service. Am I right about this or not? I went through it with all, all, all of my bunch of kids, and the truth is, is they had to have all this community service and serving and all that. Here's what's happened in America. And I'm not saying there are no sincere people in all of America that serve for the right reasons. I get there's plenty of sincere people. But I'm telling you, it's kind of become posh. And now it's used often to beef up your resume. Even if you're looking for a job. One of the things, because see, now they can look at you on Facebook and figure out what you're doing. They're looking to see, and I've actually had conversations with people say, well, you know, I make sure I post all the stuff that I do for, like, going down to the soup kitchen and all that, you know, because I want, you know, people to see. Can you see how that might just maybe might be perceived to be self-serving? I met a waitress, or I saw one of the waitresses uh, this week, last week on Friday morning. Went into IHOP to have some coffee, <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm just sitting there doing my thing, and she comes up, well, I'm working on my sermon. No, this would have been earlier, maybe Wednesday. And I'm just, I'm working on my PowerPoint for the presentation. So if you don't like it, it's IHOP's coffee is the problem. So I'm working on, my, and she comes up. Well, there it is. See, I kind of go incognito in these places because when people find out you're a pastor, a lot of times they don't want to talk to you. And so I'm doing my thing, and she sees the word love like this big on my computer. She says, what are you doing, man? Are you really intense about that? And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm preaching. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give a talk about love. Well, where do you talk? Well, I finally had to admit it. I'm outed. I'm a pastor. And so, so she says to me, oh, you can't believe the experience I had today. So she's taken some class in psychology. And the psychology professor at school asked her a simple question. Why do people do serving? Why do they do these uh, uh, things like go to soup kitchens or, or serve people who are poor or serve uh, and work with a, a variety of different things that people do and help build houses and put on roofs and all that. Well, she immediately spoke up and said, well, they do it because it's the right thing to do and, you know, and because it's honorable and it's good and it shows love to people. Now, she's telling me all this. And the professor looks at her and said, what decade were you born in? And what he communicated to her was is that while, yes, there are people that do things from a motivation at, at, at a great place, here's the problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are many who actually do things for the purpose of you to look at them and for the, them to have their own internal sense of, I'm amazing, boosted. And he went on to give several different reasons. And she looked at me and she said, is he right? Well, first of all, I said, I just want to shake your hand. You, you, you got a pure heart in terms of doing things. But, but the truth is, is he is right. As a matter of fact, it goes even further than that, and this happens pretty often. Is charity, that's the word used here in this passage, is investing my time, energy, and money in people who have needs a good thing. Everybody say yes. Yes, it is. See, it's good. 
while there's nothing wrong with that, here's the problem. If when I look at other people and I see them not doing it, I make a statement or a judgment or an internal sense of evaluation that says, man, you're really missing it because you're not doing the thing I'm doing. What they've done is set up that thing they're doing as the pinnacle of all that is service. And we've got to be careful about that. The Corinthians were doing that in a very big way, and it goes like this. It's the I do it right show. And by the way, because you're not doing it the way I'm doing it, it's out of order. All these things where people are doing, and there's one last one. He says, if I give up my body to be burnt, I give everything I have to the poor, and I give up my body to be burned. Now, you need to understand at this particular time when Paul's writing the Corinthian letter, the whole Nero burning down and the kinds of, kinds of things that we hear about in terms of persecution of Christians in that particular way was not happening. So it's not likely he was literally talking about his body being burned, but the whole idea of the eventuality of maybe it's coming, but even if it wasn't that, the idea was is that I'm going to give my life away. Well, listen, the Scriptures teach that, that Christ calls us to give our life away when nobody's acknowledging it, and maybe some people are trying to take away from it. And I've talked to you about it before, that this world squeezes us, one, to show us our need for Christ, but the second one is so the life of Jesus will spill out on everybody else, right? So it's not that the idea of ultimately giving my wife, my, not my wife away. <laughs> Sorry, babe. Uh, uh, giving my life away is, is a core principle in Scripture, but only as it is motivated by Jesus within. But can you see what a problem it would be? There are actually some people that love being designated as the resident martyr. You know, they give away more than anybody else, and that's exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. And this is not the only passage that talks about this stuff. But the truth is, is all these things are things that they were doing well. So what's the takeaway on this first part of the passage? It's very simply this. If you're trying to define whether or not you're a person of love, don't go looking at the stuff you're doing. While it may be a natural expression of the love of Christ within you and you cooperating with him, just because you're doing it, doesn't mean you're a person of love. And so a part of your goal this morning and a part of my goal is to evaluate where I am with the stuff that I'm doing because the next step to that is saying, look, I'm doing all this stuff, so I must be blessed by God. I must be a really godly person when indeed I can be doing all the things, whether it has to do with spiritual gifts or not, <laughs> um, all for the wrong reasons the reasons that lift up myself. Let's go again to the passage of Scripture, and you're going to hear now about the real deal or no deal. Beginning in verse 4, he says, Love is patient, it's kind, it does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant, it is not rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at the wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. This part I don't like. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, here's what happens. And you're right, love never fails. But Paul says, look, so if doing doesn't do it, that in of itself, you figuring out how to do it, putting it into your schedule, making the thing happen, if that doesn't do it, that why you're doing it and the core of what's motivating you to do it is ingenuine. And not only that, he goes beyond that. This is not just about, well, you know, you just need to get a little better. It's about that it actually hurts people and drives them away from the living Jesus who gives life. But then he says this, so I'm going to give you the real deal about what love is, and if the real deal isn't a part of your life, then there's no deal with him working in you, and the impact that you expect to have in life will be nil. Real deal or no deal. So I'm quickly going to mention these, and I've grouped some together for the sake of time. But first of all, he comes up and he says, love's patient, it's kind. Now, just so you know, in this passage, he is not talking about patience with circumstance. He's talking about patience with people. Because the truth is, is, circumstances are hard and they're difficult, and sometimes we need people to walk through them with us, but it's circumstances. I mean, how do you beat up circumstance? How do you yell at circumstance? He's talking about having to deal with people. And if you want to know, if I could cap and uh, just summarize what patience and kindness is, it's this. 
is you find yourself wronged by an individual in or out of the body, but specifically Paul was talking about within the body at this particular moment, you're wronged by them, and then you see your opportunity. You can take them out in a very spiritual, correct way, of course. But you have the opportunity to put them in their place, and this is not about speaking truth, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's because, look, I was just waiting for the chance to get this done, and you refuse to take it. You refuse to take it. You, 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 you bear with them for the purpose of, yes, them coming to a place where they're yielding to Jesus, but do you refuse to take it because you want what is best for them in their life, and you will trust Christ for the offense that you're feeling? Secondly, he says, uh, this, the real deal stuff, has a lack of envy. Now, there's two kinds of envy in the Scripture. The first one is, is I want what you got, which was exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. Because it was kind of like this, and this happens in today. David and I have had conversations about this. It's like every Sunday, somebody had to outdo the next Sunday. So if somebody, in, in the context of what was going on, because Paul said, all the gifts are fine, but you guys have been doing but that doesn't do it. And so they would have, maybe have tongues or prophecy and a variety of different things. And by the way, there are some would say, and he also mentioned the whole idea of knowledge, <clears throat> you know, that there's special knowledge, which we'll, we can, um, uh, we're not going to have time to unpack this morning. And then one writer said, well, you know, I don't believe that was the special gift of knowledge, spiritual gift of knowledge. It was about intellectualism. You know what? I don't even care. Because the truth is, is I've seen people who, by their definition, have a word of knowledge. And when they walk around after they give their word of knowledge on Sunday morning, they're walking around like this. I'm a big deal. Yeah, I'm a big deal. Randy said I was a big deal. And I've also seen men who are incredibly brilliant actually talk down about other people who are not as brilliant as they are in the Scriptures as well. And one of those people would be me in the past. Now, I'm not that brilliant, but I still thought I was smarter than everybody else according to the Scriptures. So you see, all of these things end up being problematic. And so what would happen is, is since they're trying to outdo each other, if you saw me do a particular thing on a particular gathering of the body, I would want what you want. But there's a second kind of envy that was even worse. It's not only do I want what you want, I hate the fact that you've got it. Now, whether that happens in the body of Christ or out of the body of Christ, our goal this morning is to ask you to take a test. You say, well, I don't like tests. I don't care. You get to take a test this morning. And the test is, is where am I in relationship to this love thing? Now, don't go too far. But the question, where, do I, where am I in relationship to this love thing? And the question would be, have you found yourself recently bothered by the fact that somebody else gets acknowledged and you didn't? In the church? Out of the church? Have you found yourself going, well, you know what, I'm way more responsible than they are, and I can't even believe they got, you know, somebody's praising them for something. They don't even know half about that person. At that point, envy is in my life, whichever version of it that you have. <clears throat> so that's not the real deal. Here's another uh, uh, part of it that he describes as the real deal or there's no deal. There's lacking of arrogance and rudeness. There's a missionary whose last name was uh, Kerry, and he did a lot of ministry for a lot of years. And uh, more towards the end of his ministry, he started dealing with some people in the country he's working with, and it's a, it's a beautiful story. I just don't have time to go into the whole thing. And a fellow was trying to put him down because of his background, because he didn't have uh, a long pedigree. And this is what the fellow said to him. You know, you're just a shoemaker. This is in front of a bunch of people. And here's a guy that literally changed the world that he was operating in because of his heart and passion for Christ and serving people. And this is what Kerry gets up and does. He says, oh, oh no, I'm, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. I don't make shoes, I'm just a cobbler. I just repair them. You see, this guy began to understand something. He understood, <clears throat> excuse me, that under the hand of God, that all that he was able to do came from God himself. And so arrogance was not a part of his life. And the guy that was talking to him was just rude. Now, some of you may be saying, well, Tim, you know, you're kind of one of, you're, again, you're the doctor of love. You know, you're not going to be unkind. You're not going to be abrupt to people. Well, first of all, yes, I am. 
But there's a problem with bluntness that's there just for the sake of bluntness. Now, I'm going to confess something to you because I want you to think about this test that I'm giving you as we're describing what real love looks like, what's a real deal and what's not the real deal. Not too terribly long ago, and I don't even remember the details, or I would tell you what they are. I was talking to David Hedig in his office is right back there, and I was talking about talking to someone that wasn't in our body. And, uh, you know, it was just a conversation I was having. And I started bragging about how I stuck it to him. I don't even know if David remembers it. Fortunately, David always presents the other side of things and kind of balances things out. But I'm telling you, as I was studying this today, I realized at least that day, and there's probably been more days, that I was direct and blunt, and I'm not saying direct and blunt is always bad. You get this? Please go like this if you understand. I'm not saying there's never a time to be direct. What I'm saying is if I'm direct and blunt for the sake of saying, man, I, yeah, baby, I'm the man, then all of a sudden what could be used of God becomes a tool in the hand of Satan. And here's the problem with bluntness. It shows great strength. And I can remember the feeling I had when I was having the conversation with David. But it wins very few people and here's the thing, it invites reactions, and those reactions are often not that great. Now, I understand that sometimes people don't want to hear what you've told them, right? But, and they can give you a reaction, but the question is, what's the reaction for? If you were just being um, <laughs> blunt, for the sake of being blunt, then it won't go out with the power of the Spirit, and it is not the real deal love. Uh, real love uh, lacks boasting. Have you ever noticed that when you start becoming boastful and proud, things like, you know, I'm the man? Um, it's like being in the pool, and you're trying to get to the top, and you don't know matter how many heads you use to get there, and they're drowning all around you because you're lifting yourself up. I want that image to stay in your head because of this. There's one thing that fixes boasting. And understand, if boasting is in your life, it's not the real deal love. And I don't even care how many things you're doing to serve in this body or out in the community. If you're boasting about it, even if you're really good at boasting about it so nobody really knows that you're boasting about it, the one fixes the two fixes. First of all, to recognize that you're where you're at and you're doing what you're doing because God brought you. I'm sorry, you probably didn't hear that. God brought you. Don't be so impressed with your great ability to know and understand and to reason and to intellect your way into this. The bottom line is, I know still far more than I'm ever going to get done. And I'm not making excuses, I'm just looking at the reality. And if there is any maturity in me right now, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ brought me. Now, if I had an hour, I would stop right here, and there are people in this body that I love desperately for one reason. If I said, how did you get to where you are right now and this thing that's going on in you right now? Because they were people who fought what God was doing in their life. And this is what they'd say. By God's grace, he drug me along even when I wasn't wanting him. Amen? You see, I come to a place where I recognize that God brought me. And here's the last thing. Boasting can be fixed when you realize there's never enough time. There's, you can't give enough in relationship to people. There are times when we give particular things or different things than you should be given based on the place where they're at in life and whether or not they, they, um, there's discipline in, uh, uh, required. But the truth is, is continuing to give is not optional. There's no, uh, uh, the real deal, let's go rights. There are people who insist on privileges and there are those who embrace the privilege of giving away their life. And if you find yourself to be one of those people, and you say, well, Tim, how would I know? And we need to hurry along. But how would I know if I'm a person that is uh, 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 hanging on to my rights instead of giving my life away? You ready for this? If you've got a friend, somebody here at the body, or your mate, and you're going, you can't believe what they just did. You can't believe what they just said. They can't talk to me like that. 
you know, I've got a right to this, and I've got a right to that. And a lot of times people use the actual word. How many of you, whether or not you were brave enough to say it to somebody you knew, how many of you have actually, even in your head, at least in your head, demanded your rights? Well, listen, now, there's a lot more of you guys than that, because I know you have. Because I end up getting offended by people, and I say, you, I, I, you know, I'm more important than that. I, I, you, you can't do that. Newsflash, a crucified person doesn't have any rights. And Paul says this, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I don't live, but Christ now lives in me. In the life I'm now living, I live by faith in the Son of God. A crucified man does not have any rights. Take that to your marriage discussion the next time. The real deal is not irritable or resentful. I understand there's a difference between righteous and unrighteous uh, and indignation or anger. The truth is, in righteous indignation or anger is when somebody's doing something against the God of our universe or they're sinning in such a way and that you hate sin. But the truth is, is sometimes I start, I'm talking about me, don't know about you, I start where I get mad that people are sinning, that I see the destruction in their life and I start in a good place and then I give them the great wisdom that I bring to the table. And they ignore the whole thing. And then my righteous indignation turns into unrighteous indignation, and I get angry. <clears throat> Excuse me. But here's the point. What makes it not no deal? When my reaction to you happens, it shows far more about me than it does about you. So it ends up in a bad place. So a part of the test this morning is you're thinking through what we're doing. We're just about done. Is for you to say, get in your mind the people who are offending or have hurt in and out of the body of Christ. And ask yourself, what was my reaction the last several times I dealt with them? Whether or not I yelled at them or not is not even the point. Because I can sin against the brother in my head long before it ever comes off my lips. And if I've done that, then guess what? I don't have love. I don't care that you did the ten things that they required of you or they expected of you to begin with. If they offended you and your response was not what Christ would call you to, it speaks more about you than them. There's no yeah. In the real deal of there's no yeah when bad comes. I refuse to rejoice in the person's misfortune. I grieve over their coming undone. Okay, I'm not going to ask you rub your hands, uh, rub your hands, raise your hands on this. But the truth is, is there's been times in my life when people that I've tried to work with, and I'm not talking about counseling or anything like that, just people that are in my life that I care about and so on, and they not only ignore me, but they say, eh, what do you know? And I go, okay, I'll just watch. And when they come undone, whether it comes off these lips or not, here's what I say. Hey, you got yours, didn't you? Now, i got to tell you, this particular form of no-deal love, I hear in the body of Christ a lot. I hear it in the form of, yep, they're going to get those. You know, I, I tried to warn them, I tried to tell them. In arrogance, because they're now uh, relishing the fact the person has failed, when they do actually come out of it, if they do, they're never anywhere around to help the person move on from there couple other things quickly is this that the real deal love rejoices in the truth there's times when I don't want to say the truth and to be honest with you there's times when I don't want to hear the truth but the scriptures say in Ephesians that if I hold up the truth the light of truth that the darkness disappears catch this some people want to take everything else I said about love and apply it and say so you see you just never say hard things to people that's just not true if I love someone, I'm willing to say the truth to them no matter what it costs me. Here's what happens. When you talk about real deal love, it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things and it endures all things. And here's what I say to that. You've got to be kidding me. You mean I have to keep bearing with you? I had one guy, one commentator said it like this, that 
Love really believes all things. And he says that means if somebody comes to you and tells you something, even if you know it's a lie, you just believe it. I got news for you. The guy's a great commentator, but he lost his mind that day. Too much coffee or something. The truth is, what is he talking about when he talks about love really believes all things? Here's what he's talking about. The God of this universe has said that I'm always moving and I'm always working. And if you will bear up under this, if you will endure, and if you will place your hope in me, not in people, then I will bring whatever needs to happen in them and you to full completion. Right? Listen, how many of you have discovered in life, I know this is going to be a really hard test question, that the best of people have times when they just completely disappoint you? And they're annoying to be around. My heart for you is to see this. The real deal is our focus in terms as we make a decision about love is to continue on. My time is up. I want to close with this. The rest of this passage, he he makes some very specific things. I'm not worried about the PowerPoints right now. And it's this. And I'll just quickly uh, look at the passage. He says, for prophecies are going to cease. Tongues, they'll cease. Great knowledge. It's going to pass away. He said, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the partial comes, uh, when the, when, <clears throat> excuse me, prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. He goes on to say, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child and I reasoned as a child. But when I began me, man, I, I gave up childish ways. And now I see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. This is the part I want you to hear. Now I know in part, and then I'll know fully, even as I have been known. He closes and says, look, the good stuff is as good as it is. And he's been talking about all these kids. He says they're going to fade. It's a huge discussion, but he just says, you guys, I'm not arguing with you about gifts. He says, but those things are going to fade, and guess what's the only thing that's going to remain? Love. You say, well, Tim, how how, how's all that happened? I suggest... The passage that says this, he says, there's coming a time, he says, I only know in part right now, but there's coming a time when I'm going to know fully, he says this, just as you are known. You want to know what the secret to having the real deal love be a part of your life and be, be the hallmark of this body is? It's not you taking the test, making a list of all the stuff you're getting wrong and go make it right. I mean, in terms of, I'm going to make this right, we're going to become a church of love. There's stuff about not loving people I've never learned. And here's the secret. Go get with the king of the universe. Jesus will take the written word and the living word will make those things become so passionate for you. You can't do anything but obey. Because why? Why? Because the all-knowing God of the universe will make it so that you can be known by Him. And when you're known from Him deeply because you've been hanging with Him, when He whispers, you know what, you go ahead and love even though I need you to endure in this situation because of this. You are so known by Him and you so know Him that you run to the place that says it's going to cost me. You see, we've got to quit making lists. The truth is, is we have to quit taking tests. This morning, this is what I want. I want you to determine. I'm just going to have a moment of quietness, and Randy's going to come up and close us out. But I want you to determine that, Jesus, I want to be known by you. I invite you to come know me and figure out, more specifically help me figure out how the expression of love which is, it's been defined as is impossible can be done and then empower me to Jesus you come be my words you come and be my patience you come and be my endurance because the truth is is people are too annoying and will never get there unless being known by him so infuses our very being that we yield to him close your eyes please just take a moment to ask Jesus where you are on the love test. And it may be as you're spending time with him right now, before you leave this place this morning, you'll recognize that there's a place of being known by him that he is now calling you to talk to another 
to address another, to fully complete this love that he has for you. In Christ's name.